Is the UK and in particular London a money launderer's dream? Do you think the UK is the safest place in the world and, and the most immune from receiving criminal funds? Of course it isn't. Obviously, we know that everyone in the government steals. The people who do the crime are not the people who launder the money. Let me fish for some secret information here. If I want people to not believe I'm a bad person, I'm going to give lots of money to charity. Corrupt people look like lizards. Crypto at the moment is the currency of crime, but not of money laundering. Hi everyone, my name is Andre. Welcome to another episode of our video podcast about things and thank you very much for tuning in. If you are currently listening to an audio version of this podcast, uh, please make sure you check out our YouTube channel as well. It's About Things Podcast. If you are currently watching this on YouTube, uh, please make sure you hit the like button, uh, subscribe to our channel, write a comment if you like the video uh, and share this video with your friends. Our guest today is Graham Barrow. Uh, an anti-money laundering expert who previously worked in financial services for a really long time and is uh, currently working with uh, various NGOs and banks, helping helping them to target this issue. Uh, he's also a co-founder of The Dark Money Files, uh, uh, an educational platform focusing on money laundering and an extremely insightful podcast with the same name. Um, thank you very much for coming on. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. So to maybe just start with... Uh, sort of simple thing for our listeners and viewers who do not necessarily, uh, you know, are not necessarily familiar with this topic. Um, what does the dark money in the dark money file stand for? What does it mean? Dark money? We have a problem, and which I'm sure we'll talk about, Andre, about money laundering and corruption and financial crime and fraud and cybercrime and all these things. And coming up with a definition for all of those things is quite hard. And we just decided we're just going to use this expression dark money. And what we mean by dark money is simply money that enters the system that you can't definitively say you know where it comes from. So if you can't say, I know that came from, I've just sold my house. I mean, literally, I just said that on the way here, I had the phone call to say, we've received the money, you've sold your house. So we definitively know, my bank will know when that money comes in, it comes from a solicitor and I've sold my house. So if money's entering the system and you think, I don't know where that's come from, I can't positively say it's legitimate, we call it dark money. Mm -hmm. And that just helps us out in, we can then cover a whole range of subjects. It, why is it a problem when the sort when when we don't know what or where the money comes from? Do you know it's a question I get asked a lot, and it's a really important question because why should we care? Mm -hmm. People say, but it's just white collar crime; it's just crime on paper. But it, but it isn't. So let me paint a little picture, if I may. To imagine you live in, and I'm going to pick um, part of the near where you come from. I'm going to pick Donetsk, which is the disputed part of Ukraine. <coughs> So life stuff's there anyway, because obviously you're, you're caught between two powers. But let's say you're just an average Joe, and you, you're working, and you pay your taxes and all the rest of it, and you've got a family. you kind of got a right to expect that when you pay your taxes, that they are applied for the benefit of the infrastructure of your part of the world. So they pay for education for your kids. They pay for the health service that you need if you're sick. They pay for your roads to be maintained. And actually, a lot of the, the money we look at is derived from corruption. And, and what, what happens is that that money, instead of going to the schools, the hospitals, the roads, is effectively just creamed off by, by I was going to say people in power, but actually it's men in power because 99% of all of this is done by men. It's creamed off by them and, it, and, and it's using um, financial structures to get that money out of Donetsk and very often into the West, which is kind of odd because obviously the, the whole stance is pretty anti-West in Donetsk, but, but they like leaving their money here because it's nice and safe and secure. And it'll end up in some apartment in, in the swanky part of London or in Miami or in Monaco. And that part will be empty for 50 weeks of the year, probably, because they don't really live in it. So it's kind of hard to defend. Why would we defend people being deprived of their health care and education, the things that will allow them to make something of their lives? So somebody can buy an apartment somewhere that they never live in that's dark, and probably a car, a Bugatti or something that's in a garage for 50 weeks of the year. It's just indefensible. Where There are people who are dying for lack of good health care, while others are buying you know, 100 million pound properties they never live in. Why why would we not be angry about that? Mm -hmm. 
No, I absolutely agree. But the thing is as well, um, people because because people can't directly make this connection and uh, sort of you know this white collar crime as you say money laundering corruption it all kind of feels remote from the actual crime being committed uh, some people because they don't understand the connection necessarily the direct the, the direct connection uh, they can even be cynical about it they don't just hear but like Whenever I speak to somebody from Russia, for example, you know, uh, it's almost this sort of cynical approach with uh, where they say, well, obviously, we know that everyone in the government steals, but we're kind of OK with that, because if the new guys come in who, you know, kind of especially those ones who talk about corruption, they're going to steal even more. So whatever. Yeah, it's it's kind of a weird thing. The other the thing that when they change governments is always the new government always blame the old government for being corrupt and will be different and, and, and they're not. But I'm going to tell you another story now and it's nothing to do with money laundry, but I love the story. And it's a story of a man who's walking along the beach one day and off in the distance he sees somebody who looks like he's dancing. Why is that person dancing on the beach? And as he gets nearer, he actually sees what he's doing is he's picking something up from the beach and running to the to the seashore and he's throwing it in the sea and he's coming back and he's doing this repeatedly. Mm-hmm. And the chap says to him, what are you are doing? And the man says, he says, every day when the tide comes in, it washes up starfish on the beach. He said, I love starfish. But they get marooned on the beach and that bothers me. So every day I come down and I come and pick up starfish and throw them back in the sea. And the chap said, but there are thousands and thousands of starfish and and you can't possibly hope to make a difference and the chap says give me a minute picks up a starfish goes to the water throws it in comes back and says made a difference to that one Mm. and and that's the only approach i can take uh it's like eating an elephant you can't eat it in one go you have to eat it bite by bite And, and my suggestion if you ever want to eat an elephant start at the front um but it's a bite at a time. But but saying the problem's too big, therefore we'll do nothing about it, is right. not, that's not an answer. So we need to do something about it. Mm-hmm. And being on programmes like this, mm-hmm. our own podcast is, is our way of chipping away at that mm-hmm. um, apathy. No, for sure. I, I think your podcast is really, really insightful. And Thank I've you. been following it for a while. Um, no, I think sort of, yeah... Uh, the th- <laughs> Something very important to think about here is always that is always the fact that um, the money f- uh, the money stolen from the sort of poorest people in the world are being stashed in uh, bank accounts in banks in sort of the richest countries in the world, including the UK and London actually, uh, which is infamous for its uh, you know failure to prevent money laundering. Uh, you know, with people like, I don't know, Dmitro Firtash, uh, a wanted Ukrainian oligarch, currently wanted Ukrainian oligarch, who, um, you know, is allowed to buy mansions uh, here and donate uh, millions no. to the University of Cambridge and stuff like that. Um, and the list obviously doesn't end there. It just it could just go on and on. So is the UK and in particular London uh, a money launderer's dream? Yes. I mean, I always think of it's a bit. It's a bit like you know, if you ever if you ever do physics, you have this thing called matter and antimatter, and I always think of this as Robin Hood and anti Robin Hood. It is kind of robbing from the poor and giving to the rich, isn't it? The way it works, and and London is very happy to receive that money, and it's a problem. It, it the, the London economy has been at least partly fueled by this money. So I mean, anyone who lived in London will know there is a significant emigre population from former Soviet states, Russia particularly, but Ukraine and others. Um, and it's helped to, to, to fuel a, certainly a property boom, but, but even that's not helpful because what we find is, I mean, we found in, in COVID times, is people who work in really significantly important service industries are finding it impossible to live close enough to London to to come in and work. So if we're not careful, if we don't manage this situation better, we're going to be in a situation where lots of very wealthy people live in London two weeks of the year, but the economy will start grinding to a halt and we have no service economy because nobody can afford to live close enough to do the jobs. We have to address it. And we've heard some fine words from the government, but it is problematic, particularly with the Conservative government. And I'm not being political here, I'm just being factual. The Conservative government is funded primarily through donations and a very significant number of those donations have come from uh, former um, Soviet citizens. There's a a lady called um, Lyubov um, Chernukin, Chernukin, whose husband was a former member of either the Duma or he was a mayor. Mm -hmm. You know, um, this is problematic. 
uh, given that we also have a problem with corrupt money coming from the same areas that a lot of the donations are coming from. So I'm not, I'm not directly accusing anybody, but it does present something of a conflict of interest. I do have an issue sometimes, and I kind of understand sometimes what, when the Conservative Party sort of defends itself in this in this scenario, because they, because uh, this Lubov Chernukhina, for example, as far as I understand, she's a wife of a person who used to be either a, like who used to hold like a very very senior position. Uh, within the Russian government, even, but that was like really, really long time ago, and I and I think then he fell out with the uh, political establishment, and sort of uh, there was a criminal case even opened against him, and that's why he moved away. Yeah. So there is always this sort of important, um, for me at least, there is I think there is an important distinction to to make between uh, somebody being dangerous just because he's Russian, or somebody being dangerous for an actual... I, I absolutely understand, and, and, and I think potentially over time I've become a little bit cynical about these yeah. things, because it's certainly not unknown for these um, confrontations to be engineered solely for the benefit of getting into court and having these, often there's significant settlements, and therefore that settlement involves the transfer of funds to settle. Mm -hmm. They fall outside of the... Uh, money laundering regime, right. so we don't have to do due diligence on those. So, um, you know, it could be politically advantageous to, to have those sorts of apparent fallings out. I am not for a minute suggesting that Mr. Chinookin didn't actually fall out with the powers that be. But, you know, we have to tread carefully here because we do understand that, um, you know, m most countries, including our own, run dirty ops campaigns. Of course, Russia now has a reputation through. You know, incidents like Alexander Litvinenko and, and more recently um, the Salisbury escapade with the Skripals and others of, of running these, I think they're called wet work campaigns. Um, and that just makes life difficult to distinguish between what is genuinely somebody who has fallen out with a regime and is now def a friend of the West and somebody who apparently has and but, but potentially is, is not a friend of the West. I'm not at all well placed to answer those, but I just think, sadly, if you work in my world, a healthy dose of cynicism is actually an important thing to have. Um, so, if we come back to the whole to the whole question about whether London is a money launderer's dream or not, I think, uh, and as you mentioned as well, there were some sort of efforts to sort of uh, tackle this issue. Uh, so, for example, uh, you know, the whole um, idea to introduce companies' house uh, to sort of. Uh, you know, initiate a little bit of a little bit more of transparency into into uh, companies to make them file, uh, you know, financial accounts, etc. Uh, however, there's been a lot of criticism f coming from you and yep. people and people like you uh, regarding companies house in particular. And so, what do you think? What, what do you think is wrong with that? Um, so, I'm going to be careful to distinguish between the people who work at Companies House, who are wonderful people, and I actually work. Um, uh, with or, or talk to and they do the best that they can they're constrained because they, they, they operate under a 170 year old charter which wasn't designed or written at a time when any of these problems were even dreamed about so they're constrained because Companies House is a register and I, I'm not sure people fully understand the difference, it is not a, a regulated body, it's not like the Financial Conduct Authority, it's not like the Bank of England, it is solely a register of companies and they don't do any checks at all and neither are they allowed to. Now that's currently under review. Um, oddly, um, I won't be getting there because we're recording this session, but there is, uh, I, I attend regular companies, our stakeholder meetings where they report back on how that um, review is going. Now at the moment we have a problem because the government having announced they would do all this reform of companies house didn't include in the Queen's speech very recently uh, any sign of resources being made available to do it. But at the moment we have a super transparent corporate registry uh, which I would use every single day to great advantage and in some respects the poor quality of the information there is its own usefulness because it, it helps to highlight some, some uh, inequalities or ambiguities which point to some potential suspicion so so it's not the end of the world but the thing about london is yeah we've started this process we're opening up companies house it's a good thing um the eu have, have said that all eu member states must do something very similar we have a peculiar legal system in the uk which is another reason why we attract so much of this dirty money because you can sue people into silence and you need very little contact with the uk to be able to institute proceedings in the uk and it's not unknown for extremely wealthy people to use their wealth and some very 
expensive lawyers um, to to stop um, investigations from even beginning. So. Isn't that what's what's currently happening to uh, Catherine Belton, the author of, of uh, well, Putin's people, Putin's, Putin's people, Putin's exactly, people. where she sort of, yes. uh, you know, tracks. It's actually, by the way, it's an amazing book and I it recommend is. it to everyone. It's I a great piece of work. I particularly remember, uh, I recommend chapter five, there's some really good quotes in Right, chapter five of some bloke talking about limited liability right. partnership. So, so she's currently being sued she by is. like I don't know f- multiple Five or six. multiple Russian oligarch- oligarchs, is. including Roman Abramovich, okay. uh, yes. famously the owner of Chelsea. Yep. Um, so, is this is this sort of an example where people are trying to trying to sue her? And do you think do you think they will succeed? Um, it'll be interesting. I think some of them are are doomed to failure. They are they are just. Um, flippant kind of cases where people are trying to engineer a case um and she's got the full backing of her publishers which is fantastic i actually i, I you know I, I know catherine we've spoken on many occasions so i was being slightly flippant about the quote but but i did provide her with some background information when she was writing putin's people yeah. so I'm kind of aware of that um yes and i think uh, i think also uh, tom burgess who wrote a book called kleptocracy is now having some challenges from uh, a company that used to be called uh, ENRC, yeah, they've changed their name, but it's the Euro, Euro-Asia Natural Resources Company, mm-hmm. uh, based in Kazakhstan. Right, yeah. Um, and a guy called, um, he's an Israeli guy whose name now escaped me, Dan Gertler. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think he's now facing some court cases as well. So it is a problem in, in London, and it's another reason why we attract so much of this money, is because it comes with the... Um, you know, with the added bonus of, of having a very malleable um, legal system. Well, yeah, coming back to Companies House and sort of the um, uh, the whole the whole idea how it's not actually a regulator and they're they're not actually required uh, required to check anything any information, uh, which can result into financial uh, financial accounts being fake, yeah. right? And famously um, signed by Ali Moule as <laughs> your 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 dear friend, <laughs> my dear friend. Yes. yes. Um, so what I'm just wondering is what is the incentive for companies to actually not file fake accounts? It's a really really good question, but I'm, the, the answer is going to be is quite complex. But I will make it as simple as I can. First of all, just for the benefit of people who may not know this. Mr. Moulet is, a, is actually a, a dentist originally from Iran, uh, who, who I think trained in the UK, then married and lived in Latvia, in Riga, and, and now lives somewhere in um, Belgium. Um, and in his time in, in Riga, uh, depending on which story you, you believe, either signed or, or had his identity stolen and this was being used to sign accounts of UK companies now just to give you a sense of the scale of that and this will probably give you an insight into my mind which is not necessarily a positive one um my company and, and particularly my my son george and i have been putting together a database of every company that's filed accounts in the uk that bear mr Moulet's signature we're currently up to i think 2400 wow um definitely 7000 sets of accounts with his signature on one flavor or another there's probably at least another 3,000. One of the things that's happened very recently is Companies House has just opened up a further five years' worth of filings because they've gone from 2015 to 2010. So we have a whole bunch more to look at. So so there's probably at least 10,000 sets of accounts in Companies House with his signature on. And and overwhelmingly, the range of those accounts in terms of the income they de- declare is between 0 and 25,000, which is just anyone who's a statistician will tell you is just bonkers totally manufactured and actually what we see is some days every set of accounts is identical they don't even bother changing the figures it's just, it's ridiculous it's stupid but 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 then first of all limited liability partnerships which is what they sign for are not taxable entities so there is no there is no set of accounts ever lodged at Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs to validate them against and most of these companies don't do any business in the UK anyway, so so there's no margin for checking. But even with limited companies, it may come as a surprise to some of your viewers or listeners, um, there is no validation between what's filed at Companies House and what are filed with the revenue. There is no system to say, are you filing the same account? So mm-hmm. much the same as, as everything else that goes into Companies House, it is just a piece of paper with some writing on. Mm-hmm. And that's about as much value as it really has, which is not to suggest that overwhelmingly people file legitimate accounts, mm-hmm. but they're never the ones I look at. <laughs> you know, that's always the, you know, that's just the world I inhabit is, is not 
legitimate mm. companies. And it'll be very interesting to see, actually, in about a year's time, the huge number of companies that were formed at the time the government announced the, buy, the bounce back loan scheme to, to help with COVID. There was a really significant upsurge in companies. Mm-hmm be interesting to see in 12 to 18 months just how many of those actually file any accounts or whether they were created simply to apply for a bounce back loan mm-hmm. and then disappear into the ether. Apart from all the other stuff that you're currently working on, you also worked with journalists who published uh, FinCEN files in 2020 recently. So for those uh, viewers and listeners who uh, or haven't heard about it, it's basically a very large leak from the US Treasury of suspicious activity reports um, filed by various banks. Suspicious activity reports are um, basically reports that the banks are required to file with US regulators uh, when they see something suspicious happening in their bank. Um, yeah, and so the reports basically describe over 200,000 suspicious financial transactions uh, that were valued at around two, uh, $2 trillion that occurred uh, between 1999 and 2017 across multiple uh, financial institutions around the world. I'm going to highlight a couple of a, cu- a couple of examples that were like really kind of really really interesting to me. Uh, one of the reports, for example, included suspicions that a secretive offshore company uh, that had accounts uh, at J.P. Morgan uh, was ultimately controlled or could be ultimately controlled by Semyon Magilevich, uh, who is widely considered to be like a Russian organized crime boss. The brainy don. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Uh, oh my god, I saw uh, like uh, a footage uh, of his interview with like the BBC, the Panorama one. Yeah, from, John um, Pilger. Yeah, from like the late two thousands. Yeah yeah, 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 and that's just like you can. I mean, I don't want to make any claims here, but like. Uh, his appearance kind of uh, gives it away. I'm, yeah. so, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> like you don't yeah. need much more. But, but that's the sign of a man who has no fear, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, of co- exactly, of course. You can put it that way. You can put it that way. Uh, apart from that, at the same time, uh, another report suggested Barclays uh, who worked with a company that, uh, once again, uh, was used to buy like, expensive art by the sanctioned uh, Rottenberg brothers, uh, famously the judo partners and childhood friends of the Russian president Vladimir Putin, who conveniently win many government contracts in Russia as well, apart from being sanctioned. Uh, so the conclusion basically of these fins and files, as far as I understand them, was that while the intelligence uh, in the form of these, you know, suspicious activity reports were there, or was there, uh, the banks as well as US regulators yeah. did sort of very little to actually stop uh, yeah. these potentialist it's, activities. Andre, it, it's nuanced and, and it's probably it's a couple of interesting things. One, actually this week, um, uh, Natalie Sales Mayflower Edwards, who was the lady who leaked it, has actually been identified. She's just been sent to prison for six months. So which is the first time, although I, I, I knew that from the work I was doing, mm-hmm. um, She's actually been BuzzFeed, who were the original receivers of that, have actually confirmed as she was sent to prison that she was the person who leaked the um, SARS. It, it is really just want to give a background to that because it's it, it, the SARS were a very special set of SARS and they were actually gathered together at the request of um, the um, uh, the Trump dossier team that the FBI team headed up by the chap whose name has now just gone straight out of my head, former head of the FBI, and I can't think what his name was, the um, Lordy, the guy who ran that whole inquiry into the Trump. Mueller. Mueller, thank you. Robert Mueller. Mueller, Yeah. Yeah. Um, He asked for any SARS that might relate to uh, known uh, Russian connections with Trump or... um, so, so there was about eleven to twelve hundred of these SARS that were gathered together, and and they were the ones that were leached to to um, uh, to Buzzfeed. So they form a very specific subset of the of the two million that are filed every year in the USA, and, and all of them are are what are known as correspondent banking SARS. So without going into too much depth, these relate to transactions that were not actually done by clients of the reporting bank; they were done by clients of the bank who uses the reporting bank to, trans- to, to, to to move dollars around the world. So, so for example, the JP Morgan one, JP Morgan was acting as a correspondent to the bank who were banking these companies. Right. Now, I mean, there is a story there. And one of the things you think, well, this is ridiculous. And, and very often these SARS are highly retrospective. They were being filed long after the activity had happened, which is why nothing ever happened because it had already been and gone. 
And there's one, I, I have the great pleasure of knowing a gentleman called Paul Radu, and Paul is the head of, a, of an organisation called the Organised Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, and, and he does deserve people's um, astonished praise because he has actually gone undercover in places like Medellin to, to report on narco wow. in Wales. Wow. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I sit at a computer and, and search the internet. It's not quite the same, is it? Um, um, but but Paul said that, uh, and he worked on this. So, so we all met. Um, I had the great privilege of being involved on that story for about fifteen months prior to it being made public as a kind of technical advisor. And I, I met with the entire team over in Hamburg about a year before the story broke. And 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 that that particular one, um, J P Morgan cottoned on to the fact that uh, Semyon Mogilevich um, was potentially involved because it read some reporting which ultimately had come from an OCCRP story and then so Paul was saying it's really weird but I'm reporting on a SAR that was generated because of reporting we did previously mm-hmm. on a story that JP Morgan probably wouldn't have known about but for that reporting so and that's an issue because it means actually the banks are identifying suspicious activity based on the work of investigative journalists who are publishing stories that then leads the bank to think, oh, we ought to have a look at that. Right. And JP Morgan were slightly put out to find that actually when they did look, they found more than a billion dollars relating to this company that, that ostensibly was ultimately owned and controlled by Mogilevich. Um so was it actually controlled by Was it like... Oh, I wouldn't want to say that. <laughs> I'll never drink tea again if I... If I was to say. Um, certainly there is, there is very good quality circumstantial evidence to say that, that okay. Mogilevich was, was, the, um, was the ultimate beneficial owner. It actually came... That there's a, there's a, a, a Russian website called areumafia.com mm-hmm. um, which, which just publishes stories about potential Russian mafia. So obviously they're quite interested in Mr. Mogilevich as he is alleged to be mm-hmm. um, a very significant um, head of a very significant right. um, uh, gang. He disagrees, yeah. He, he vehemently disagrees <laughs> yeah, and yeah. says he's an honest man who has never done a dishonest day's work in his life. And that's what he says. Yes. He does. Right. Uh, and and fair play to him to do that with a straight face. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, well, okay. Um, from what you're describing, though, it seems like there is a significant degree of ignorance going on, uh, at the very least, at the very best, I would say. Um, yes. Do, so would, do you think when J.P. Morgan sort of realized this from, you know, some investigative reporting that was done, uh, because they didn't bother or hadn't bothered to actually check who the ultimate owner of the company was did they did they then stop sort of uh, working with this uh, working with this company or nothing not? to stop by then because it had been gone and finished so right, uh, right. So, so that's one of the issues right. um, it, I mean it is possibly one of the more embarrassing sentences that, that was published is, is actually within the SAR JP Morgan had to admit that they were not completely sure who the ultimate beneficial right. owner of the sentence was now they were the correspondent but but it's still really important because mm-hmm. Because they have they have duties around right. sanctions as well as money laundering, and if somebody's a sanctioned individual, their details should be known. And if if you are transacting business on behalf of somebody who's sanctioned, you're not allowed to do it, and you have to put a freeze on it. So, so to be actually doing business, and and, and a number of the sales across more than one organisation mm-hmm. identified, and there was a there was a really extraordinary exchange of emails between Barclays in the US and Barclays in London, where US Barclays were asking London Barclays for additional information, and they were saying, we don't actually know. Wow. Which okay. is, you, just, you don't so, want to see that. So this is something I actually wanted to ask you. Do you think this is a result of, uh, and I know you don't want to make any direct claims or anything like that, but do you think this is a result of <sighs> deliberate sort of deliberate nefarious action in which they uh they suspect that there there might be something somebody very very bad or potentially very very bad or sanctioned or whatever owning this particular company and they choose not to find out that information or is it just ignorance and somebody doing their job very badly well, because it would be a, a proper you know English kind of compromise approach. So it's probably a bit of both. Right. Um, I think it's probably worth just contextualising. Uh, one of the things that I, I do a lot on the education side of the work we do mm-hmm. is to talk about risk. So, so, so financial institutions face huge numbers of different risks. Not just this risk that they'll process laundered money, but credit risk and exchange rate risk and reputational risk. But let's talk about credit risk. Now, what does credit risk mean? Credit risk is, is where you lend somebody some money and they, they default on that loan. So I, you know, let's say I, I as, a, as a bank lend somebody a million quid 
dollars, whatever, and they go bust and I lose the money. Well, I have a powerful reason for, for assessing the risk there because if they go bust, I'm a million quid out of pocket. Mm. Or, or if I, you know, I assess reputational risk because if our reputation is badly damaged, the value of the business can go to, to, to nothing. Mm. Money laundering risk isn't quite like that. And let's take Danske Bank, which we may well talk about, but let's bring it into the conversation. Danske Bank had this branch in Estonia, which over the period of seven years managed to put $230 billion through that one branch of a bank, which was just about equivalent to the entire Estonian GDP for that seven years, which was unbelievably profitable. And that's the issue, is that money laundering, actually, in a way, banks make money because they process all that money and they get a fee for it. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, you get found out, you suffer reputational damage, and Danska is going through that pain at the moment. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the the people who put that money through are are people who are paid at least partly on results, and therefore they have a powerful incentive not Mm -hmm. to find it. I work with a whole bunch of software companies who are producing some really fascinating artificial intelligence engines. But I have to keep pointing out to them, you know, they they think it's going to change the world. I said, no, you've got to think, you're going to go to a bank and you're going to say, we've got this really expensive software and it's so good, it's going to start um, helping you to not do business with a whole bunch of people. It's not necessarily the best sales line in the world, isn't it? We want you to pay lots of money for our software so you can do less business. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're up against. So when I say it's a combination of willful ignorance and turning a blind eye and often conspiracy because we also know in Estonia that 13 of the bank staff have been arrested mm-hmm. for conspiring with personal persons unknown to help to launder this money it's a whole combination of all things and on top of that you have this extraordinary thing called confirmation bias which is worth a whole episode all on its own which is that people interpret the facts that are presented to them in a way that meets their existing view of the world because they don't want to be finding out that their existing view of the world is is a, is a falsity and they need to reorient it. Mm-hmm. Um, this actually takes us to uh, another sort of one big problem for itself, which are Western enablers, mm-hmm. uh, because I think this is a very similar um, modus operandi, basically, that they have that you just described. And then, um, you know, when we have Estonia, uh, it sort of, you know, it doesn't have the best reputation in terms of money laundering, etc. In, in general, Baltic states don't have uh, the best reputation in terms of sort of, uh, you know, their financial systems. Uh, but if we, if, we, if we talk about like some Western institutions and what kind of clients they, for example, work with and choose to work with, uh, when, let's say, for example, they have a pot- a particularly high uh, risk appetite and I'm sure I'm sure very often people who are you know trying to onboard these new clients would try to whitewash their reputation would try to would try to sort of um, say that whatever allegations there are uh, against these people aren't actually you know true or it's all sort of rumors and um, sort of black PR etc which is also a very very big problem now obviously they're making a lot of money out of this because uh, they basically operate on this so the more people they bring in the more money they bring in the more money they get themselves but this is a really really big sort of problem when you just choose to do that uh, willingly and I think that already kind of um, takes you to the you know when when you say it's a little bit of both between whether it's a nefarious action or whether it's like sort of deliberate ignorance or accidental ignorance um i think some people actually try to make it look like uh, try to make their deliberate ignorance look like it's an accidental ignorance i couldn't agree more which i think is a very big problem uh, actually i'll share another story with you i'm not going to name the financial institution but a well-known private bank um at the time i was doing this piece of work had an office in Zurich and it had a very significant Central and Eastern European desk Um, and I was doing some training on uh, enhanced due diligence when you take on what we call PEPs, politically exposed persons so these are people who've worked in significant offices in government and I was doing this piece of training and it was only about an hour and a half but I couldn't help about 20 minutes in the head of the Central and Eastern European desk a guy called Yevgeny um, was just kind of slumped in his chair looking at the ceiling, you know, and I wouldn't say I'm, a, I'm an expert on body language, but I would have said he disengaged with the training. Mm-hmm. Um, so I stopped and said, you know, Yevgeny, you, you, you don't really seem to be very engaged in this. He said, oh, I don't need this training. Okay, it's just very important about enhanced due diligence. I don't need to do enhanced due diligence. 
<laughs> really? No, no, no. He said, I know my customers better than any enhanced due diligence will ever tell you. I said, that's extraordinary. How, how do you manage that? He said, I have lunch with these people once or twice a year. <laughs> Okay. Come on, Evgeny. Come Evgeny. on, Evgeny. Um, so then I said, look, let, let, let me just ask you a question, Evgeny. I just want you to imagine for a minute you were a, you were a corrupt politician or, a, or the head of an organised criminal gang. I just, for, just for imagine, I'm going to call you Semyon just for the, for the sake of a name. Um, and you had huge amounts of money to launder. I said, just out of interest, who would be the first person you'd want to befriend? He said, oh, well, my banker, of course. And then as he said it, he realised, well, it said, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I'm... But because you know, there are there are things that these people do. One is that they will, and one of the reasons why we have very strict gifts and entertainment policies now is that they will lavish huge amounts of money on people that they want to be on their side. They want them to be kind of um, taken over, if you like. They want their loyalty to be to the customer and not to the bank. Mm -hmm. um, they they will, and there'll be. Philanthropic. I mean, one of the really odd things about significant corrupt people is the amount of money they give to charity. But that's we call that reputation laundering, mm -hmm. which is if I want people to not believe I'm a bad person, I'm going to give lots of money to charity. Now, obviously, lots of good people. I mean, people like Bill Gates and that. Are, I'm not suggesting for a minute he's a he's a bad person. But quite a lot of bad people, for example, pay huge amounts of money to have a game of tennis with Boris Johnson. You right. Know? Not that they particularly want to have a game of tennis with Boris Johnson, but it's a way of looking good. Or, or they'll create a, you know, a, 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 they'll endow a college at mm -hmm. Oxford or Cambridge because because we all want to think they're good people. And some of them are, don't get me wrong. That's quite interesting that this Yevgeny said, uh, said this to you because, you know, I definitely ask Yevgeny, Yevgeny, do you think that... Do you think that corrupt people look like lizards or do they have like differently shaped heads or horns and exactly. stuff like that? Um, obviously they don't and obviously they can turn out to be the friendliest people you can possibly meet. Yeah, and so. it didn't help that particular bank then got fined about 700 million okay. Swiss francs for, for turning a, well, I'm not even going to say turning a blind eye, for being involved in what's become known as the 1MDB. Yeah scandal um, and frankly I mean there's an email trail which which just beggars belief of how they were managed to convince themselves that the 700 odd whatever million instead of the 70 million that they were expecting wasn't a problem and it's just oh yeah no these things happen you know too bad Yevgeny it's just, yeah. does, does he yeah. still work there you think? I, 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 I don't know <laughs> they've changed hands since so it's right they've, okay. They've, they've, yeah. okay understood um, <clears throat> Also, um, another thing that I've sort of heard you say quite a lot uh, when you gave interviews regarding this FinCEN, FinCEN leak, uh, you were saying you were saying things like that uh, banks what they what they choose to do is that they choose to keep the regulator happy rather than doing what they should actually be doing. And I'm not sure I'm actually very clear on that. I don't actually. Um, could you maybe give a, give us yeah. an example of? Where so, you know, where yes. would this be applicable? Uh, we've already mentioned SARS. Obviously, the FinCEN's were SARS. So, so what? One of the measures that's often made against banks is they will look at what what we call key risk indicators, which is kind of boring jargon for how can we evidence the bank is taking all of this seriously? And and one of the key risk indicators will be the level of suspicious activity reporting that the the bank does, because in a way, kind of the more they do, the more they're taking it seriously. I don't think that's true, actually, because um, we end up with what's known as defensive SAR reporting, which is, if in doubt, file a SAR. Um, and here in the UK, something approaching 600,000 SARs are filed now every year. Now, you remember that the, the, the National Crime Agency, which which is our, they're called financial intelligence units, but the financial is housed at the National Crime Agency. And they have about 120 people working there. Now, if you do the maths, that means that they're all handling huge numbers of SARS every day. Now let's look at the amount of asset forfeitures we have in the UK. And I think last year it was something like 136 million quid. Now, if you look at that, we have a thing called the National Threat Assessment, which is just looking at the, the big picture. And I think most estimates are somewhere around 80 to 100 billion is laundered through the UK every year. So if you do your sums and you look at 600,000 SARS and 136 million of, uh, of asset forfeitures, you'd come to the conclusion that's an awful lot of SARS for very little action. And that's what I mean, really, is that is that ultimately banks are far more focused on, on ticking the boxes and producing the paperwork that demonstrates to a regular that you're following regulator, sorry, that you're following the rules, mm -hmm. rather than actually focusing on doing something about stopping the real flows of money. So it all becomes about avoiding the fine and not stopping the 
criminal financial flows and that's true actually not just at a national but a supranational level we have we have supranational things called mutual evaluation reports by by the grandly titled financial action task force uh, which have been going on since 1989 where i think we're on round seven of them can i point to any thing that's actually made any difference to the flow of criminal funds around the world no because because countries now go out of their way to get a good evaluation report and, and we here in the UK got the best one ever mm-hmm. in 2018 and 19 and yet are somebody do you think the UK is the safest place in the world and, and the most immune from receiving criminal funds of course it isn't mm-hmm. so there's just there's no you cannot correlate actual action against criminality and the f- flows of dark money with the measures that are put in place allegedly to see whether countries or companies are conforming to the rules uh, what do you think the measures should be, at least in the UK? Um, what, yeah, what should be in place to sort of avoid this situation? Well, in a way, looking them on a country com- by country basis is futile. Uh, and the reason it's futile is I have a, a good friend called Oliver Bullo who, who wrote a book called Moneyland. And if, if anyone's interested, yeah. just read the book. It's a great it's, book. It is a fabulous book and it's so accessible. Mm-hmm. And it's got a golden toilet in it. I mean, <laughs> what book would you not want to read that's got a golden toilet in it? it One just, of my favourite parts about the golden it's, toilet. Uh, Mr Yanukovych is just a source <laughs> of so many... Um, uh, interesting stories. Anyway, um, but Oliver, uh, his whole thesis is that is that while law enforcement, of course, respects uh, country borders, dirty money doesn't. Uh, that's why he came up with this idea of money land, which exists in this world where there are no borders. It can be in two places at once. Uh, you know, you can have a company that's, that, that's formed in the UK but is controlled in, in Nevis, which is this little island in the Caribbean, which is one of the most secretive places you can be. And ultimately, your money can be in both places at the same time because the house that, that the company owns is in London, but the owner is in Nevis. So it's kind of like, if you're interested in, again, in physics, it's like that superposition of states. It's like, Schrod- I call it Schrodinger's cash, <laughs> which is really it's there, but stupidly it pleased with that expression. <laughs> it but, is a good one. But, uh, Schrodinger's cash, yeah. It, it's, it, it's the, is, it, is it there or is it somewhere else? Because we don't really know. And that's the problem with looking at the, the, the issues on a country by country or a bank by bank basis. Mm-hmm. It is like giving somebody a piece of a jigsaw saying, what's the picture? Well, how can you tell from one piece? You know, we have to get better at, at integrating our, our approach. So, and that started. Okay. For, for example, the Dutch banks now, we have a thing called the, the, the Netherlands um, Transaction Monitoring, uh, TMNL, um, which, which now is, is banks are combining their transactional activity and monitoring it on a, on a combined basis. It presents all sorts of interesting technical issues, which are probably outside the scope of this, yeah. because you need to preserve people's... Um, personally identifiable information Mm. but actually that's a step forward because we're now looking at a much broader data set and seeing much better activity than just on a bank by bank because the criminals will always arbitrage the system to their own benefit well it almost sounds almost sounds like fighting the windmills to be honest with you Um, if if you need to sort of get every single jurisdiction around the world or at least every single jurisdiction where the crooks uh, keep their money in uh, if you need all these jurisdictions to kind of cooperate together, that's never going to happen, no. especially no. especially given a lot of these jurisdictions exist, uh, sort of their economy sort of is based on the fact that they provide these sort of, you know, uh, corporate services and sort of can incorporate these offshore companies yep. that you can't, yep. you know, you can't trace their yep. ultimate beneficiaries, etc. Yeah, it's it, one of the questions I'm often asked is given how much we know about what happened to Danske Bank in Estonia, we know a lot now. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Why hasn't more action been taken? Why haven't people been arrested? And, and you know, I was very fortunately, I, I, I have a whole set of bank statements from there, which, which sadly I can't, I can't disclose because they're highly confidential, but they are interesting. And a typical situation would be uh, an, um, a, company that, a company allegedly operating out of Moscow, mm-hmm. but it will be using a UK limited liability partnership, which has got two, they're called designated members, but think of them as directors. Um, that are themselves companies based in the Marshall Islands, also highly secretive. Um, They've declared an owner who lives typically in somewhere like Donetsk, which you can't get at, and they're banking in in Tallinn in Estonia. So if you think about it, we've got Moscow, the UK, we've got the Marshall Islands, we've got Ukraine in a difficult part of Ukraine, and Estonia. So so first of all, who is going to do that investigation? Are they going to cooperate? I don't think so, you know. And and, But but at a basic level, people will probably ask, well, how... Did it come to pass that a Russian um, 
commercial outfit, it wasn't particularly commercial, but there you go, um, used a UK company to bank in Estonia using Marshall Islands directors and, and an owner who lives in Ukraine. Well, that's easy a question for Danske Bank to say how they managed to rationalise that that's OK. Yeah. But given that set of circumstances, I mean, we could equally talk about what happened in Beirut last last August, because that also is a fascinating story and uses uh, UK companies. It's mm-hmm. not been, but but actually, you start that story and that ammonium nitrate it was bought in, in, in a place called Batumi in Georgia. And as you will know, that I say to people, that's the one in the Caucasus, not the one that has the golf tournament every year. Um, it was bought in Georgia, allegedly heading to Mozambique. It was loaded onto, a, onto a, a boat that had a Russian captain that was flagged Moldova, which is interesting because Moldova's landlocked. I don't know how that works. And was owned, um, and the boat was owned by a Panamanian company. So again, five different jurisdictions, and that's how they work. Almost a prototype of uh, Oliver Bolo's money land. It's, 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 the more countries you have involved in any transaction, the less likely you are ever to be prosecuted or even investigated right. because it demands far too much cooperation from countries that will have been chosen for the lack that they for the point that they will never cooperate with each other mm-hmm. exactly yeah let me fish for some secret information here uh, i know you probably won't give it away but no. i will still ask you uh, are there any uh, leaks such as fincen panama papers paradise papers in the pipeline in any time in future i don't want any details is um, there anything coming anytime soon i, I I, I have to be really careful how I answer this because I, 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 I can't so remember, there is. I can't remember how many NDAs I've signed in my and non-disclosure agreements, right. but it's a lot. I, I'm going to say mm-hmm. that I think there's going to be a couple of interesting stories breaking this year that might not actually be in the manner of a, a FinCEN files, mm-hmm. but I think they will change the conversation. So oh, wow. okay. um, I, I I'm looking forward to to some a couple of stories breaking this year, which I think will be um, quite eye-opening and relevant to anyone who's followed um, the stories that have gone before. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sorry that's a bit obscure, but that's as much as you're going to get. Not at all. As long as, as long as I know that there are things coming there that, they, that, that, that will at least partially improve the situation in which we currently live in. Um, yes. I, I, and I'm going to say I, I am hugely optimistic that, it, that, that they will. That's already good enough for me. Yeah. Um, as an anti-money laundering expert, uh, are you worried about you know potential money laundering risks associated with uh, cryptocurrencies? I know this is a little bit random question, a completely yeah. different topic, but you know there is this increasing popularity of cryptocurrencies, and the whole point of them is that the source of funds are unknown. Yes, and I, I find this a fascinating question, and one I'm very happy to talk about. Somebody said was saying the other day, because on ra- on the radio, because Bitcoin, of course, is anonymous, and, and I wanted to say no, no. Bitcoin isn't anonymous. Mm-hmm. Bitcoin is on a public ledger. You can follow it everywhere. The people who own it may be anonymous, but but the Bitcoin itself is not. Mm-hmm. Um, I I think you need to be careful how we deal with crypto because at the moment I think it's massively too volatile to be uh, used by people laundering money. I do think it is a currency of criminal activity. I think you need to be careful about that. So if, if like me, and I, you've probably done this yourself, Andre, if you delve into what the people call the dark web, it becomes very clear very quickly, you can buy all sorts of stuff, most of which is illegal. And the currency of buying that is Bitcoin. Uh, and almost exclusively Bitcoin. You'll yeah. hear about Ethereum and Dogecoin and all the rest of it. But Bitcoin is the currency of the dark web. But I also believe that the vast majority of people who, who, who take that Bitcoin, the criminal organisations, turn it into fiat currency at the very first opportunity, mm-hmm. because as we've seen in the last few weeks, the price has plummeted. Probably as we speak. Yeah. It goes 50% up and down. Yeah, yeah. it was down to about 25,000 quid yesterday. I don't know what it is today. Um, yeah, which, which is annoying, because I used to train this when it was 250 and never thought to actually buy any because I used to think, how is that worth £250? How stupid am I? Um, so I, I think crypto at the moment is the currency of crime, but not of money laundering. Mm-hmm. And in a way, why, why should it be? Because, because you can launder money effortlessly. 99% of all dirty money entering the system never gets detected. Why, why would you change that? What's the point? It works fine. You don't need crypto because it's so volatile. Mm-hmm. But it's a great thing to actually do crime with. Mm-hmm. 
I do think one particular type of people do use crypto and are prepared to accept that volatility. And I think that's sanctions. So I think we need to be quite careful. I mean, if you're in North Korea, for example, very difficult to get access to the world's global financial um, system. Crypto becomes a, an acceptable volatility because it enables you to move money around the world out of mm-hmm. North Korea or into, depending on what you're doing. So I think from a sanctions point of view, crypto is a problem. I think from conducting criminal activities it's a problem i think from a point of view of actually physical money laundering i i would i would suggest that there's probably money more money laundered through for example you know virtual currencies inside of online gaming activities mm-hmm. and and potentially places like ebay and paypal and and amazon than there is through crypto because it's just a whole lot easier mm-hmm. and a whole lot safer and a whole lot less volatile so so you know these people oddly money launderers are pretty risk averse you think how that how can that be but it, it, they're professional i mean actually that's probably worth a quick conversation the people who do the crime are not the people who launder the money i think that's a common misconception they are professional money launderers and and so all this money that went through Danske Bank ultimately was put through by a very small number of uh, organisations who create huge numbers of legal entities and provide bank accounts and all the rest of it for a very wide range of people. So you have the criminals who then access professional money launderers to do the, the money laundering. Um, so, so kind of, and, and they are you know, if, if a criminal, if, if a corrupt politician has just given you several hundred million dollars to launder, you're not going to take too much of a risk with that money because if you lose it, I suspect it's a fairly terminal occupation. Mm-hmm. So they are pretty risk averse. Um, so, so that's why I think crypto at the moment hasn't, isn't, I think most people's view of it is not quite aligned to the reality. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Um, also, uh, you know, a lot of people are criticizing it, but actually in some authoritarian regimes, for example, crypto is used uh, in, in a positive way. And I'm sure Bitcoin can, Bitcoin in particular can be used in many positive ways. For example, the Anti-Corruption Foundation, Alexei, Alexei Navalny's organization in Russia, has been funded for a really long time by by Bitcoins because the donation were made in Bitcoins because a lot of its accounts were constantly being frozen, etc. So it was much easier to, to do I that. think I think blockchain, I think stable um, virtual currencies on a blockchain have all sorts of potentially massive... I mean, if you think about foreign aid, if we were able to give foreign aid via a blockchain technology, it would be really hard to steal that without people knowing it's been stolen because the whole point about a public ledger is you can track the movement of that money. Mm-hmm. So, so if you're giving aid to a country and it's on, a, on a, some sort of virtual currency on a blockchain... Try stealing that because we'll know. I just think there are huge potential benefits. I mean, blockchain, and it's a bit like it's a bit like websites and the internet. People don't necessarily understand the difference between blockchain and currencies. I mean, one is a one is an infrastructure, and one is something that sits on the infrastructure. A bit like a website sits on the World Wide Web, and, and a currency sits on a blockchain. Blockchain, I think, has just got huge, huge opportunities and advantages. And it's a, it's a bit of a shame that Bitcoin has probably muddied the waters to some degree, but. Um, Graham, thank you very much for this. It's been a great pleasure speaking with you. Um, there was always there's, there's this one question that we always ask at the end of each episode. Uh, so, and this question is: If there was one thing in the world that you could change, what would it be? See, my initial reaction was would be my date of birth. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, Fair I, enough. I'd bring it forward a few years. But um, I think the one thing I would change, I'd, I'd go back to 1989 and I would restructure the Financial Action Task Force differently. I think, okay. I mean, you've got to remember, it was brought into being for a very specific reason, which was a massive drugs problem at mm-hmm. the time. It was for nothing else. But but if we, knowing what we know now, if we'd have gone back to 1989 and changed something, I would have structured it so it wasn't a, a country by country organisation. It was a proper supernatural organisation that actually looked at countries in in networks, so that we weren't so that the whole point of it was to see the interoperability between or interactions between different countries and and assess it on that basis because it would change, I think, overnight mm-hmm. how we view dirty money flowing around the world oh interesting but that would be also quite difficult to do no because a lot of countries would have their own issues with their sovereignty and stuff like that it would bring them into um into focus wouldn't Mm -hmm. it but but yeah i would and even if you can't do it globally i I just would have wanted to to have a much more integrated approach Mm -hmm. because at the moment uh, even now here we are what are we you know 40 years later near enough 35 years and we're still thinking on a country by country basis and and that's just not the problem and we have to change that right It, it is the great great um, anomaly of, of, of corruption is that the corrupt 
people will never leave their money in corrupt countries because they don't trust the other people in that country. Right. So even if, if certain countries did not wish to participate, if we could just get you know, the relatively you know, democratic, transparent countries to organise themselves mm -hmm. collectively, mm -hmm. it would make it very difficult for that money to find a home. And uh, it's like all of these things. There's no point getting corrupt money if you can't spend it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, 30 years ago, I was an estate agent 30 odd years ago in, in 1989, oddly. Mm -hmm. And you could still go into your solicitors at completion day with a suit, suitcase of cash. Um, I have to say many Russians that I knew bought their houses in London and with a suitcase full of mm -hmm. cash. It was at the time, it was fantastic. In retrospect, maybe not quite so brilliant, but but yeah. So so I think um, you know the the criminals will always look. It's like a it's like a, a chain. They'll always look for the weakest link, and we need to stop them being having weak links and and having that approach. I think would be massively helpful. Great, thank you very much for this, Graham. Really thank appreciate you. this. It's been a pleasure.